Hello everyone, my name is Anna Brees. It is the 21st of July and uh, we are going to be talking to Simon Dolan. Um, Simon's an entrepreneur. He owns 10 businesses and employs around 600 people in the UK and overseas. Now, Simon, I was watching an interview where you were on, on our YouTube channel and they called you a national hero and you were behind the judicial review that was a challenge to the government over the legality of lockdown and thanks to you, things like the Sage Minutes have come out. So much has happened. Um, so thank you for, for what you've been doing. And, but we're also joined here by Leah Butler-Smith, a behavior analyst speaking to us from Chelmsford. Simon, you're in Monaco. Thank you both for coming on the channel. Um, what an interesting few days, especially with the amount of media coverage that you've had for the campaign called Keep Britain Free. Now this is a place or a, a, a platform or a channel on, particularly on Facebook, where people can meet, uh, share content, but also arrange demonstrations. Now, there's two big things to talk about. Uh, the big demo that you were really behind, Leah. Um, you know, having spoken to Simon yesterday, I, I realized that you contacted him and you kind of started those protests all by yourself. And then all the media coverage that followed, um, and then so much more interest in, in the organization Keep Britain Free. And the kind of people that turned up at the protests really was, was striking, wasn't it? I, I think you, you're gonna talk about that. But um, as well as that, the mandatory masks, um, that's the kind of, that's the line, that's the angle that I think a lot of news organizations are taking at the moment. And that's what the protest was about, I believe. Is, is that right, Leah? It was mainly about mandatory masks. Well, it was the trigger, but actually we had an awful lot of things to talk about that were regarding the harms caused by the lockdown measures, um, the lockdown itself, and then the measures that have continued after that. So it was, it was the fact that it was just another thing that didn't make any sense is very confusing. Uh, it, it, you have to wear them here, but you don't have to wear them there. The police haven't worn them at all. They've lobbied heavily not to have to wear them, and they even lobbied not to have to enforce people wearing we'll, them we'll come to that in a minute what i just do want to say at the beginning of this is a lot of people do media interviews don't they and i i did two yesterday okay bbc northern ireland and bbc london they were very very different and very often when you get interviewed by a journalist you think i don't really like the way that went i didn't like the way i was represented i didn't feel it was balanced this is the beauty of my channel of youtube where we can have balance and we can come out and say well you know, some media handled this very fairly, maybe some not so. So BBC Northern Ireland was, uh, it was quite outrageous, to be honest with you, what happened to me yesterday morning. But I was still welcome being on channels like the BBC because it's full of an audience that aren't on social media. And so if they said something like to me, oh, you seem, what you're, you're, the narrative you bring is dangerous, um, talking about herd immunity or, or building up herd immunity in the summer to protect us in the winter. Um, that's that's a debate that's a healthy debate balance and the number of people that called in was overwhelmingly anti sorry pro masks uh, pro uh, mandatory vaccination pro mandatory masks and i was very much a lone voice but the power that we have now obviously is we can come together on channels like this and share you know our experiences of the media and whether that, that balanced argument has been put forward or not so when i was on bbc london yesterday it was uh, it was very it, it was a little bit more fair I would say and I know you were as well Leah now you have been on been interviewed by um the mail for two hours today Simon um we had Sky News cover this big protest and I think it's really blown up and there's a lot more media interest now in the keep Britain free movement but what I want to say in this interview that we do now is when I was interviewed yesterday the BBC said to me we need somebody to come on the show who is um against mask wearing and I was like well not, I'm not really wouldn't say that particularly, but I, I had to have a particular line to go on the show. I actually want to go on the BBC and be a journalist. Do you know what? I really want to be able to go on the show and say, journalists, please do your job. Let's get some balance out there. Let's have a debate because people are asking questions around um, freedom and choice and these mandatory situations. People are really struggling. There's so much to talk about when it comes to the vulnerable, the elderly, people missing cancer treatments, how lockdown has been dealt with. And we didn't, I don't feel, particularly BBC and Sky, uh, 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 BBC especially, are representing a balance. And that's why I've had people like GP Rick O'Shea who contacted me last night and said, well done for the interview you did with BBC London, Anna. Now, Rick O'Shea worked for the BBC. I work for the BBC. If people from the BBC are not seeing the BBC as balanced, this is serious. So I want to talk a little bit about the media. And what I would say is this interview, I am going to challenge you. And I know there's a lot of fear out there. Um, and I want to know what you're going to say to people that have contacted me and put these questions to you. You know, teachers, 
who have um, got diabetes or are, over, or are overweight working on that and, and how they can deal with their anxiety, how they can deal with going to, to work thinking that they may catch um, COVID-19. So there's a few things to talk about there. So first of all, I think there's such an appetite for talking about um, media coverage, balance, um, how we get a message out there, how we build a campaign. Um, and I know that, uh, Simon, you've got a PR company, you've got a Facebook page where people can meet, but you're also doing all these media interviews. So how do you think the media have handled this so far, Simon? Thanks, Anna. Um, if, if I'm fair, you know, I think on the whole, quite balanced, um, with the exception of Sky and, and BBC. Um, BBC have been extraordinarily quiet now this has got nothing to do with ego whatsoever but if you do a search on bbc for gina miller obviously the brexit case which is a judicial review you know you take the government to court fairly fairly big thing there was a hundred and more than 150 separate articles on the gina miller brexit case if you do a search for uh, our case or my case um, our judicial review same thing there is zero there hasn't been one single article. And we're talking about a judicial review on the most draconian laws ever passed by an English parliament, ever. You know, and there's no, it's easy to think, oh, well, it was nothing. You know, we were just locked up for three months and couldn't see who we wanted and couldn't form new relationships and couldn't go out and play and couldn't go. And you start thinking about it and you go, my God, yeah, that we actually were. And yet the BBC have seen fit to just simply ignore the whole thing. So. That doesn't come from, you know, two or three journalists just decided that they don't agree with it. That actually comes, that's an editorial, you'll know better than I do, but that's an editorial decision. That is, I do not cover this. So, you know, free market, I guess. Sky News, Leah, actually, what's really interesting, so you started this protest at Hyde Park, you know, you started to tell everyone about it. We'll talk about, tell me a little bit about the protest, but Sky News did publish something about the protest, which increased your numbers. And we have to remember different people are watching different media. And I think that has a really strong impact on their views of what we're going through at the moment. I've seen the Telegraph and the Independent discuss herd immunity. They went on the BBC to discuss herd immunity. They actually, both of them, the Northern Irish presenter, but BBC Northern Ireland said, if I'd known you were going to say this, Anna, I wouldn't have had you on. And at the end, they said it was dangerous. Some people were commenting that it was dangerous, whereas the Telegraph and Independent are having that argument about herd immunity. So what the media you watch is really important. So, Leah, that, that protest that you had when Sky obviously published it, that resulted in a new crowd coming down. Is that right? And how have you felt with the media interviews you've done and how they've handled it so far? Well, so starting with the, the protest interviews uh, at, the, at the beginning when we had the live one I think it was that that was the trigger I don't think the other that we did some other interviews in the park but they would not necessarily have gone out live so it was a sky one that went out at one o'clock and then people started to arrive and they wanted to speak to us I mean lots of people obviously wanted to speak and ask what was going to happen next they want to know what's the plan um, they wanted to know where Simon was but obviously he wasn't in the country and I did say there wasn't enough time <laughs> we had to just do this but lots and lots of people just kept saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And these were people of um, very much middle-aged, middle-class looking, elderly people, and then some with family, children, babies. That was the type of um, group of people that were there. And you and had so much support then, as well from you, you. Just to mention your opinion of the media coverage you had yesterday on the BBC, but also Claire, who's a lawyer, who's also been in the Metro. When journalists do things well, let's celebrate it. So, so sorry to interrupt there, just to mention your other media um, contacts such as Claire and uh, and how you feel your BBC interviews went yesterday. Yeah. So then the first one, which uh, was very well, it was nine o'clock in the morning, not that very early. But they, I, I didn't know what to expect actually. They asked me if I'd come on and talk about the demonstration, um, and then I very quickly realised that there was a host and then four people who were going to argue with everything I said, and that's pretty much what they did. So everything that I said, someone had an opinion um, and a way of trying to shame me in a way of trying to say that anyone who was suggesting that mask wearing was a bad thing was a dangerous person. And of course, I never did say that. Um, that, that isn't the message is that we're not trying to say no one should wear a mask. If that's what makes them feel confident, then they should do what they want to. The, 
whole mask wearing thing is a tipping point, but also the fact that it should be personal choice. So that interview was, was the first one in the day. And then the Sky interview that was live that I did. So Claire, Claire Wills Harrison, she's a lawyer. She's representing the elderly. She has a number of whistleblowers and she's had personal experience of seeing the harms that have happened. She's got some amazing evidence and information that's really, really important. And that's what the Metro want to focus on with her. But she was the first one to go live with Sky because I was doing an interview with James Sellingpole at the time. And uh, when she was, it was very biased. It was a very led. They wanted her to just talk about masks. They wanted to challenge her on why she should be anti-mask wearing. And she, so she just stuck to the fact that we're not anti-mask wearing. We're just anti people being forced to wear a mask um, and, you know, human rights sort of thing. Then later on, the one that I did at three, around 3.30, is it was a little bit easier and they actually gave us a bit more time and and even the interviewer um, yeah the reporter said he didn't quite know why that was but that was good it was a good sign that they did give us a little bit longer so i was able to expand it a little bit more and and talk about the fact that it wasn't just about masks it was much more to do with freedom and democracy and the things that have been deeply worrying um and so that was that was that one and then so yeah we we did have the press wire is it press wire where they where they have the the ones who then send it out to everyone and that was obviously just say what you want <laughs> and then some they were just balance, bit- some some balance the big 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 one here for me as a, a former bbc a journalist it's a public service broadcaster we're paying for the bbc you don't feel it's being fair simon um i don't feel it is either and leah you know we've Different feelings from different places. But what I would say is this channel and on my Twitter and Facebook and YouTube can rival and the audience rivals that of, you know, a BBC local station easily. So we can get this message out there. But it's more about trust. It's more about getting people to understand what is Keep Britain Free all about? Why did these protests take place? Um, so can I ask you that first, Simon? You know, what, what, what led to this point? And I would say this is really interesting. I interviewed you on the 5th of June, okay? And then I watched an interview you did on YouTube three weeks ago. And I think you're a little bit like me. We were quite calm when we did that interview on the 5th of June. And I've seen as more and more information has come out, so from the Sage Minutes and, and why we're suddenly wearing masks now so far along the line, timing strange. I detected in you something that I've detected in myself as well, where you kind of get a little bit more and more surprised, overwhelmed by what's happening. It's like more, I don't have to put my finger on it, sort of concerned and anxious about really what we shouldn't still be here. Okay. You know, this is months and months and months now. We're still here and things aren't changing. They actually seem to be getting worse when it comes to freedom and choice. Um, so, so just just looking back, really, Simon, since we in, I did that interview with you in the beginning of June, how you're feeling now and, and what you think about these protests and what Keep Britain Free stands for? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? And I remember our interview well, and, and we were both calm. <laughs> Maybe we've both been through a bit of a journey. But it's, I, I honestly thought, when I first started this, I thought that we were just going to get a quick judicial review. The judge would agree with me, obviously, because, you know, that's, that's what I thought. And, uh, and it would all be done. Lockdown would have been finished and we'd have been chatting about something else, you know. And then you, you know, say we got to June and it was a bit frustrating that it was still going on. But surely to God, it must be finished soon, you know. And here we are, you know, at the end of pretty much the end of July. And they're talking about putting more restrictions in place. And you think hang on a minute. And I've long, you know, long since thought that the government had our best interests at heart. But you would have thought that on balance, they kind of tried to do their best, you know. And it's turned out that every decision they have made has been terrible. And someone asked me this morning, um, you know, it was quite a belligerent question, really. But it was, oh, so you don't think the government, tell me, what, what do you think the government has done right in this whole crisis? And I couldn't think of anything. I, I, and I still can't. I've been thinking that was at six o'clock this morning. I can't think of anything that they've done right. You know, if you had a group of monkeys throwing darts, uh, options on a dartboard, they would have made more right decisions than this government has done. So I'm frustrated by how bad these people have been. I'm frustrated by the ways that they obviously manipulate language. I flat out lie a lot of the time, but manipulate language um you know that we didn't they said we didn't close schools you know the whole country heard him say um we're closing schools as of this date and then in their their legal argument was well they never closed schools what are they gaslighting you know it's 
just ludicrous. So yes, frustration, keep Britain free is all about exactly as it seems really. It's got nothing to do with whether we are, you know, anti this or pro this. The only thing that we're pro is freedom of choice, freedom of speech, freedom of liberty, freedom of choice, you know, and that's it. And if you want to wear a mask, knock yourself out. If you want to have a vaccine, absolutely. And I suggest violent and a a freedom of choice comes only when you are informed. So we need to make sure the media are informing the public. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to be, you have to be distrustful in anybody who's telling you anything. You know, my, my thing is all about people really all should be, should be taught how to think for themselves. And at the moment, all they're doing is going to either a, their recognized news source. So if you get your news from the BBC, you have a very different worldview to if you get your news from Breitbart, you know, to think of another example. Um, But that doesn't mean anything out in the world has changed. It just means you're seeing it from one angle and they're seeing it from the other angle. Um, And you're choosing what bit to believe. So I think it's very, very important. Now, vaccinations on the whole, for most people, are probably fine. They may, you know, I think the evidence is, is that they save lives on balance. But that's really absolutely no consolation for people who have died because of them or the kids that got narcolepsy because of the last rushed um, vaccine that went out or the people that have horrible side effects or, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So, you know, if I was given a choice between catching COVID, which has got almost zero chance of killing me, or having a vaccine, which, you know, hasn't really been tested and might have some side effects, I'll take my chances with not having it, thanks. And in the end, that was my choice and my decision. And if I drop dead of COVID, well, aren't I stupid? You know, it was my fault. But at least you're making your own decisions. At least you haven't got somebody else telling you what to do. So, And the great thing about being written free as well is that you're not political, are you? You're not left or right. And your freedom of choice. And, and like you said, if people want to take a vaccine or wear a mask, you just want choice. Yeah, just I want people to, to do what they want to do as long as they're not infringing on my rights. And my rights are simply that, you know, my rights to free speech and free thought and stuff. And, you know, I think this has been a really good catalyst for it. But we've been seeing freedoms gradually eroded over the course of the last however many years, you know, 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or whatever. So we we do literally now have thought police, you know, and and you've seen it before, um, before all this kicked off with COVID. Obviously, we had the whole transgender thing. And, and police literally turning up at somebody's house because they put on Twitter, they didn't think that a woman could be a man or vice versa, whatever it is. And you think that, that it really is a massive encroachment, but you let it go. And then like with Leah, you know, the, um, the face mask was kind of the straw that broke the camels. Well, this lockdown thing was what did it for me. Well, you, what I would say, I mean, I certainly don't want to be an activist. And Leah, we did that interview yesterday and I listened back to it and I thought, I'm getting too involved here. I don't want to be an activist. I want to be a journalist. And at the beginning of all of this, Simon, you and I did that interview. And I think your involvement, like you said, you just thought, I'm just going to raise a little bit of awareness here, but this will all be over. This will all be over in a couple of months. And I said to you, and I've shared you some information from Us For Them. So the Us For Them campaign uh, is on Facebook and there's groups in Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales on Facebook groups, which people can join. And, And they're working with Keep Britain Free. But the ask for them is for, for, for the reopening of schools, um, for things to kind of go back to normal for children, really, because they believe children are suffering more at home than they are at school. Um, the ask for them campaign. And I've shared some stories from a children's counsellor where children that, she, you know, she, she named three case studies of really serious situations which are vulnerable children are talking about self-harm and suicide. Now, I shared that with you and, and we're, get, we're getting more and more of these stories are coming forward. And I'm going to talk to you about this in a minute, Leah, because you've got lots of stories working in mental health as a behaviour analyst. Um, but, but, my, but you did say to me, Simon, is this getting sinister? So were the government just, was it just a mess at the start? You know, I don't certainly want to be in government making these decisions. You, you understand and you sympathise that you're dealing with a committee of 50 people. It's very, very difficult to make the decisions that's right for everyone. Yes. But when... When people start to think it's sinister or there's something going on that we're not fully aware of, and I think we may have been getting to that stage now, yeah? The country, we had to save the country, we had to go into lockdown, but here we are still looking at these restrictions with schools, with mandatory uh, masks, potentially mandatory vaccination. Do you think it's sinister, Simon, or do you just think this was a mess? I don't credit politicians with enough intelligence to be able to pull something like this off deliberately 
you know, I don't think there's a big Machiavellian plan. And I know a lot of, you know, a lot of friends disagree actually with that. And uh, there's, there, there is evidence to say that, you know, I'm wrong. But I, I kind of like to believe that actually they're just a bit stupid and incompetent rather than sinister. But, it, you know, I, I thought about this a lot because you can be dragged, as you know, so far down the, the rabbit hole of, of different theories and, and uh, conspiracies this and conspiracies that. And I got to the point where whilst I find them fascinating, really interesting, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, we still don't know who killed JFK 50, 60 years later. So the chances of us actually finding out what's going on and if indeed anything's going on are, all, are zero. You know, because even if they published everything that was going on, we still wouldn't believe them. So we'll never get to the bottom of it. So I became more interested then in, okay, whether they meant it to happen deliberately or whether it was or not, doesn't really matter. We're still in the same mess. And it's about dealing with the mess rather than dealing with why the mess was caused in the first place, I guess. And I know, so Leah, sorry, I haven't come to you for a while. I'd like to talk to you about, you know, we look at um, articles like the Telegraph of have uh, produced something that said that there may be 200,000 deaths due to lockdown. You've heard some heartbreaking stories. Tell us a little bit about those stories. And obviously that's really what got you fired up, I think, like, like you, like me, like Simon, we care about society, we care about these rural people who are suffering. The number of people who are, are, are really, you know, we talked about this in an interview that I did with you yesterday on my channel. Do you uh, talk about some of those case studies, but also do you think that people are starting to get suspicious now? Um, we all got together, we all clapped for the NHS, we were all strong and united, but do you think people are starting to, to question what in, is going on here? I think just judging by the people that I was speaking to at the demonstration, these are, these are just critical thinkers, but they will have witnessed what Simon's just described, which is in the beginning, yes, we're all in this together, we don't actually understand this virus, we have a perception from China, who, what strangely, we've never been one to particularly pay much attention to before, as in trusting what they have to say, but suddenly, you know, they are very important, what they're telling us, and then, of course, it was blowing up in Italy. So, yes, we all believed that we were doing the right thing by abiding by that sort of self-isolation quarantining and so on although even then I think a lot of critical thinkers were still of the opinion that it should have been quarantine the sick and the elderly or isolate the elderly and and, and quarantine the sick that sort of uh, approach would have been much more appropriate and actually of course that's what the scientists the scientists that's what a lot of experts were actually saying so the people that I was speaking to have known pretty much for as long as as Simon and, and I, uh, that this is not normal. It's not as the world would normally be reacting or responding to a virus, even given its status of, of being um, potentially deadly for some. But also just the, the fact that it then became very obvious to, to a lot of people that it had been downgraded by the government to a low risk early in, um, or late March, sorry. So seeing that in black and white on the government's website threw an awful lot of confusion out there as well. So there's, yes, lots of people have been very aware that it's not right and watching it unfolding and all still keeping to the idea that, well, maybe they're just being extra cautious. Perhaps they're just a little bit worried and maybe Boris has had a bit of a breakdown um, over how many potential deaths there could have been uh, and our, uh, thanks to Ferguson's um, model, which has since been massively criticised. So that yeah that's that awareness but then the stories that start to came, come out quite early on which were in health groups um these are the sorts of groups where people just sort of share experiences of how to stay healthy and um you know various sort of cures for things that, 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 that ail them and so on and so on big big groups some of them with thousands and thousands of people in there i think one of the biggest is about 40 odd thousand people and what you started to see was people sharing their own personal stories of their husband who'd been mowing the lawn and, and died of a heart attack suddenly being listed as a covid death which then changed the way that they were allowed to have a funeral how many people are allowed to be at the funeral if anyone at the beginning and they were desperate stories and then you've got people who are in hospital talking about like as i mentioned to yesterday that the parents of a girl who was 20 in her 20s who was in hospital with a very serious stomach condition had been put on a covid ward and she was able to still communicate talk on her telephone to tell to tell the family what was going on and she was petrified and i thought that's not going to do her immune system any good she's got a girl in the bed next to her who also wasn't covid but started coughing so because of the you know the the, the concerns that have been 
put out there by the media and the government, she was absolutely petrified that she was going to die because they weren't taking care of her. The other thing that started to happen, there was a chap did a live stream. He was in America, but he's an English guy. His sister's in England and their father took ill. He had some breathing problems. So the ambulance came, took him away. And so this is his live uh, stream account of what exactly happened. What started to unfold was that the nursing staff were saying to the sister that he was taking a turn for a worse and he was going to die. Then she'd called in the early hours of the morning trying to check up on him. And this, the nurse that answered the telephone very early in the morning actually said oh he's fine you know his vitals are all fine everything's okay he's doing really well I think he might be coming home tomorrow and the, and she's tried to rouse him to see if he would be able to speak to her and that's when she expressed a bit of a concern that even though all of his vitals were good and clearly what, what he'd gone into hospital with had resolved he was fine that actually she couldn't rouse him he didn't seem to be quite with it um so anyway the next day she, the the family have called together and they've said oh he's at end of life and they've said, well, but his vitals are all absolutely fine. Um, and at that point, the doctor passed, it passed from the nurse because they said, but they told us last night that he was fine, that he'd recovered, his, his vitals were okay. Um, and then the nurse went, what? And was really angry that, that there'd been a conversation to say that. Then passed on to another person who then passed on to the consultant. By the time it's got to the consultant, the consultant said, well, the reason why he's confused is because he's on morphine, because he's on an end of life pathway. We didn't feel that his quality of life was good enough. How, how can they make such well, a decision? A live stream. Well, you say this was a live stream. Did you hear the whole thing or did someone recount it after it had happened? No, this is the, the, the brother who's in America who did a live stream and it, it got shared around all of the communities. Listen, but that was... this, this, is, this is the thing. I've seen so many stories like this, but some I will not share. You know, I just won't share it. I don't know if it's true or not. What I do know, yeah. though, is, you know, my 88-year-old neighbour over there who's struggling, really seriously struggling with loneliness, hasn't been in the shop for four months. I know um, a teacher who came to the, a friend of mine who's too scared to go back to work um, because they're 65. You know, that, 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 there's what we see in our real little world and then there's what we see on social media. My real big passion here is, come on, Journalists, listen to whistleblowers. We've all seen that NHS whistleblower being shared, haven't we? You've seen that, Simon. Well, I have somebody, and it's all checked out. I've connected all the relationships on Facebook. It is legit. I've done the due diligence. A senior virologist in the UK, one of the top UK universities, has said uh, we should have gone with herd immunity from the beginning. This virus was low risk to the general population. We should have sheltered the vulnerable, gone for herd immunity, that they would not take a vaccine because a vaccine needs at least two, three years at least to be safe. Now that person hasn't come forward. I have put forward what they've said. They have not come forward because they are funded by the WHO, okay? So we need these voices, these scared whistleblowers from the NHS to have a platform to come to. Do you both agree? Um, and also for the, the good, good, more good balanced media to come out from it, for, for us guys to go on the BBC and not be told that our views are dangerous because um, we want to discuss herd immunity or we want to, to look at other ways of dealing with this situation where so many people are suffering. But Leah, yeah, I mean, you've heard, you've heard, situ you talk about Claire as well. We should talk, or I hopefully speak to Claire. Um, she's dealing with a lot of elderly, is that right? Elderly victims. Yeah. Because there's, there's a group of us on, on Facebook who we started with Jacqueline Dunn, who's a health coach, nutritionist. She went live and had a bit of a rant. Um, and that just went absolutely viral and it's had millions of views. So she's then had lots and lots of people speaking to her privately about what they're witnessing and what they're experiencing. So she's got first-hand accounts from lots of whistleblowers and she's actually set up a group. So she's been very, very proactive in supporting people. Um, she gets attacks constantly i mean it, she's it breaks her heart but she will not stop because she knows that she's actually there to to support all of those people who don't have a voice themselves and something you've just said about uh, yes that's what i wanted to just mention when you said you're talking about herd immunity you're talking about um the concerns that you've been the, from the virologist that's as you've just said the biggest issue that we seem to have is those people do not have a voice and there's us because we get an opportunity to maybe just a pit, get, you know, give them a bit of a spicy story because we're anti-mask or whatever they want to, to spin that actually 
we're just repeating what we've been finding out for ourselves. And that's a big theme on, on Facebook amongst the people who I've become friendly. You know, I've got so many more friends with people, the same sort of opinions and thoughts and feelings. And I watch some of their conversations and they're sharing, you know, books to read and articles to read and they're like I've never studied this much since I was at school probably more than what I did at school because they're so deeply aware that what we're being told is so incredibly biased and my, one of my big things that I learned early on in all of this is the huge conflict of interests it just I couldn't understand how there could be such big conflicts of interests amongst those people that we have in a position of power and influence um, that, that they have something to gain. And someone actually shared a quote earlier on that was I thought was really interesting. And it is, if you do look at who stands to gain from the story that's being told versus who actually hasn't got anything to gain, they've got everything to lose, which is all of us. Because we, we, we've all been vilified. We're, our reputations are being torn to shreds. We're losing friends and family. You know, I had a family member saying some not very nice things. My daughter had to go in and try and remind him that who I am because they know who I am. They know I'm not a crazy lunatic conspiracy theorist. I'm a researcher, as well as obviously having that, you know, mental health profession going on, which helps me to understand, um, you know, Simon was saying earlier, when you hear the word imagine, and they're using that to get people to actually put that picture in their mind of something terrible, terrible, terrible happening, and then it brings it closer to home, and that's why they've become so terrified of it. But there are, I think, as I said to Simon earlier, I think there are three groups of people. You've got the group of people who think that they've probably got to try and do some of these things they're being told to do. They did stand on the spots and they you know, might have a mask in their bag in case someone's going to start throwing stones at them. But they know it's all a load of nonsense and they'd be very glad. And they are the ones who did arrive at the the, the group, you know, the meeting a little bit later on because they're like, right, good. We've got a plan now. We've got something we can do. There's something real happening. And then you've got the people in the middle who are really not that sure, but they know it's not right, but they don't have anyone to sort of turn to, to give them a bit more evidence and explain things. And they're not maybe as curious. They're perhaps they have a little bit more trust in the government wouldn't do that to them. So they must still have their best interest. It's all a bit strange and confusing, but mm, you know, we'll go along. And then you have the petrified. And that is this new PTSD, the people who are so, they will be extremely aggressive because they perceive anyone who questions this story is actually going to kill them, that is going to lead to them dying. So it is about their personal safety. It's not about protecting anyone else. And I understand that's not what they're going to say, but that is actually what they're experiencing. I feel for those people. I really do. Yeah. And I see the fear that um, I'm not... I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm concerned of the messaging that they've been getting. And I know you mentioned this, Leah, about um, this was discussed in the Sage Minutes, that they, they, the media would be used to basically turn the neighbor on, you know, neighbors on themselves to self-police, to use and instill fear to get the, the lockdown to regulations to, to, be, to, to work. And I talked about that with uh, NUJ rep Henry Widdas, who's a, a newspaper journalist at Lancaster, Lancaster Post, and he's very concerned about that. And he's challenging the National Union of Journalists Ethics Committee about that at the moment. Because we don't feel that the media should be used to manipulate the public and to scare them. There are very many, there are lots of scared people. And you feel that those are the ones that have kind of attacked you. Yes, I, I've had a huge amount of support. The only real experience I've had was on Northern Ireland's uh, radio yesterday. But I'm not angry with them. Um, I understand I just liked a little bit more balance from the presenter. That's all. Um, Simon, just coming to you. Have, have you been? Have you suffered at all? Have you had family members fall out with you? Have you been criticised, or have you been celebrated? Um, that's interesting. Probably, you know, when I first started this, I would say probably you know, sixty, seventy percent of the messages I got um, were, were were pretty abusive. You know, the usual, which we've all had. Since then. You know, it, it, it's, it's been linear, you know, it's just gone down and down and down and you've had more and more people saying nice things and supportive things and, and uh, less and less people saying stupid things. And what, what I find, the scariest thing I find about all this is, so if we, if we just put the BBC to one side who are evidently biased, um, and, you know, one, one thing that was really interesting to me just quickly was when they introduced the travel uh, quarantine, you remember that they tried to, or they did do that for a couple of weeks in the UK. In the legislation, there were specific exemptions for people who could come in and out of the country without having to go into quarantine. Um, and there was, you know, uh, airline pilots, oil rig workers, stuff like that. There was a specific exemption for BBC employees. 
Now, that, that to me tells you, not Sky, not uh, the Daily Telegraph, not anybody else, but specifically BBC, which to me said everything you needed to know, they are actually controlled by the government. You know, if they've been given an exemption in legislation, then they're being controlled by the government. So if we put them aside, you know, you, you have a media that's chasing clicks and that's all they're chasing. You know? So the more dramatic the story, then the more clicks they're likely to get. And I don't think that's been any different since time immemorial, has it? You know, if you've got a newspaper headline that says, you know, deadly hurricane coming in tomorrow, then people buy the newspaper. If you have a newspaper headline that says it's going to be another beautiful day tomorrow, everybody goes, oh, that's nice and walks past, doesn't buy the newspaper. So I do think, you know, it's probably not changed so much. And COVID is, is just the next well, thing along the uh, along the track. Um, the, Guardian, the Guardian, I don't know if you noticed, The Guardian is struggling financially. They've gone completely different route to The Telegraph. Have you noticed the te- how The Telegraph have changed? And they, I'm sure it'd be so interesting. I'd love to speak to the Telegraph about their, you know, they're saying there could be 200,000 um, deaths caused by lockdown. They published this uh, Oxford scientists, uh, the paper talking about we may already have herd immunity. They are so different to the Guardian. It'd be so interesting. Well, to be fair, the, um, the, the, sorry to interrupt, the, the, the Telegraph, I, I've found personally have been on side since day one, m- mainly. There's, there's been far more, you know, positive articles than negative articles. Um, the Guardian, funnily enough, as well, you know, the Nord- normally the Guardian don't like me at all. Um, people like me, you know, it's nothing personal. Um, but the, um, they, they, again, they were a little bit like the Telegraph. And what's interesting with the Guardian is, is they're owned by a trust and the trust has still got 970 odd million in the account. So the Guardian really aren't struggling um, for money. They're, they're the last people actually who will go. Um, that's, that's kind of worrying in itself, isn't it? But they, it's, it's the way it's been set up, the ownership structure. It's um, a trust that will keep them funded for a long time. What I, what I find insidious about, insidious about the, the entire media is how much it's being manipulated by the bots and the 77th Brigade and the trolls and all the rest of it. Um, and I read something fascinating the other day, and it was basically it was about Russian propaganda, actually. Um, and it was along the lines of, people will adapt their behaviors depending on what they believe the majority view to be. Now, if you think about it, the majority, if you read the daily Mail, so the, in the, um, after the protest that we had on Sunday, the daily mail, uh, ran an article about it and they've had thir- or last time I looked at 13,000 comments in a day. Now you cannot tell me that 13,000 independent thinkers, went onto the Daily Mail website within 12 hours and put these comments down, of which 80% were really negative, you know, really, really negative. That can only be a concerted effort by bots, the government, the 77, whatever, to manipulate the um, consciousness, if you like, of people reading it. Because all the people that go reading down that article go, oh, yeah, actually, no, everybody does think that it's still a bad idea. Um, you know, to uh, to end lockdown. I think we all, yeah, we best be safe. And then that's it. That's as far as their critical thinking goes. Um, to change that, you just need a, your own team of people that are going around and doing exactly the same thing. You know, we've got across our groups, I, I don't know, Leah, 50,000 people, 60,000 people. Oh, definitely. If every single one of them did the same as the 77th are doing and put comments on these articles, then pretty soon you would see the the majority view change and people would change their behaviors. Simple solution, as, as far as I'm concerned, is actually just getting people to do it, you know? You, uh, that, you're, yeah. right, you're right, you don't want to be unpopular. Um, what you can only do really is stick to what you believe in and your values and principles. And, yep. and there are a few brave people doing that. What do you think, Leah? Yes, and I think, I think people are really looking for some leadership because, I, what, you know, just saying about how many people commented, I, I was very cheered by <laughs> the uh, the amount of really negative comments that have arrived on Hancock and Boris Johnson's Twitter feeds, particularly Hancock, it seems. He's so hated by the public. It's amazing. And I think even by people who might have considered that the government might be doing things in their best interest do not like his attitude. He's not a very good people person telling you telling people i have the power to control you (laughs) it's probably not the best thing to say to an adult um so yeah he gets it wrong but there are lots of people who i mean my twitter i when i did that that uh well the first one that went a bit viral was when i said where are the politicians the honest in fact that's when simon and i first spoke 
Where is, show me one honest politician who's prepared to stand up and question what's going on. Is there any? Are there any? Because I'll support them if there, if there is one, and I know lots of other people will. Uh, and, of course, that's when everybody said, well, there isn't. And now there's, but they did put forward Steve Baker, who now has blocked us. <laughs> I don't even know what I'd said to, to, to cause him such offence. But, um, yeah, so there are lots and lots of people, and they need a little bit of a plan. I think they need a bit of leadership. They need – that's what they kept asking me on Sunday. Uh, wh what is the plan, Leah? What are we doing? What's going to happen next? I'm going to br bring the interview to an end, Sue, because we've been talking for quite a while. What is, the, what is the leadership? What is the plan? And what do you think, Simon? Obviously, direct people to your to Facebook, is it? What would you, what would you say to anyone watching this who wants to be – part of this movement, uh, Keep Britain Free? Well, we've got a website, which is just Keep Britain Free, um, you know, fairly straightforward. And we've got a forum on there, which enables people to chat to one another, which we just put on a couple of days ago, but that's well. Um, and then if you just Google my name, there's all sorts of stuff about there, you know, the Twitter feed and so on. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of resource out there, you know, in terms of, you know, a kind of lofty goal for us is just simply instilling a government or installing a government that, recognizes we have personal freedom you know it's simple i don't care if it's left or right to be honest with you it doesn't make any difference anyway really um but as long as they recognize that you have the right to do with your body what you want to do and you've got the right to say what you want to say provided you're not infringing somebody else's those two rights then you know everything else is pretty much good and that that should be the basis of of any government anywhere in the world and the ones where it isn't are the despots you know, they're the North Koreas and so on. If you're not allowed to criticize the government, and again, this is what they've been doing. They've been closing down. They have the whole 77th Brigade, which is there to stop disinformation. Well, disinformation, of course, is anything that they just don't believe is true at the time. Uh, Hydroquinic story is, is a great one. You know, you got banned from Facebook for saying that might be useful. And then all of a sudden they're saying, no, actually, it's, it's quite useful. We should take it. You know, so uh, that, that's, Lancet that's pretty to apologize, didn't they, the Lancet? And I know the GP Rico Sher spoke to said he trusted the Lancet. And now, wait a minute, and uh, you're right. What are these, what is this brigade up to? The 77th Brigade, uh, disinformation propaganda. We've got to be so careful in our messaging. On All of us are journalists now, and we've all got to be make sure that we're balanced. And anyone commenting on this, this interview that we've done, Simon, I'm sure you would agree that we can, we can have this healthy debate without insulting each other. You know, th th this is important and it's essential that we do have this debate. No, I agree. You know, the, the minute it comes down to personal insults, you, you know, the, that, that's the minute at which there's no point in talking anymore. You know, you've, you've run out of arguments and so now you're just going to say, oh, well, you're this because you're bald or fat or rich or live in Monaco or this or that or the other. You know, it, it's just meaningless at that point. That's what the mute button was for or the uh, that was what it was built for, you know. Best, best just to block people that insult you and become abusive. That's what I do. Leah, finally. Muting them. muting them is far better. It's far more fun because they think you can still see them. <laughs> I enjoyed that one. So, Leah, the last question I want to ask you is what, what's planned? Are there any more protests? You were behind the successful one on Sunday. What's next? Well, I, I've had quite a lot of people sort of join me into group chats and, and various other um, things asking me to help them to organise another one. And obviously I'm not somebody who's the first with organizing it was very much wing and prayer but uh, Simon and I were talking about this earlier about having another official keep Britain free and then working out how we can support others who are doing it in other parts of the country but just to reiterate so many people did come from all over the country on Sunday and when I went into the bar afterwards I got called um, and I just stopped and I said where did you all come from thinking they were all together or maybe two groups had banded together every single one come from a different part of the country from top to the bottom and people would have come from scotland if i'd given them any more notice <laughs> you know that wasn't really the plan so yeah i think coming together with another event that gives people more time more planning you know we can get a proper little stage to stand on and a, a microphone and doing it somewhere where we know we're not going to be causing any trouble or bumping into any other types of protests that aren't necessarily uh, around the same idea but also I was talking to Simon about having a keep Britain free Facebook group because Facebook groups are very very popular but there are lots and lots and lots that are very anti-lockdown and concerned about things happening so I think we need one that is for keep Britain free Simon's going to talk to to, the, to his people and then we can manage that and monitor that but we can still give links to all of the other groups because they are of the same mind as in let's get back to being normal normal uh, but they just have some other ideas about things that aren't necessarily 
the Keep Britain Free. Um, so do, do any, any further protests, demonstrations will be advertised on Keep Britain Free. Uh, so yeah. people need to go there. Anything that you would like to add, Simon or Leo, or anything you'd like to say to each other? Well, I'd like uh, to say thank you to Simon because I already told him he saved my life pretty much. I mean, I'm not a suicidal person, but I had reached a point, I think when you really know what you know, you can actually, there's an awful lot of real, so people who are quite frequently speaking about feeling so hopeless. And it was when I saw Simon's um, legal uh, case that I just thought, oh my God, we've got some hope. Now we've got something to really get behind. And that's what I did. I got behind Simon and so did Jacqueline and Claire and, uh, and all of us have really just been so so pleased to, to to have him board so you really are a hero simon thank you uh, very kind of you to say leah thank you uh, it's probably you know the most gratifying things i never thought for a second at the start that it was ever going to turn into anything like this um you know much less having a uh, having a positive impact on on people's lives so um yeah and, and i have had i literally got a suicide note on twitter um, one Friday night about nine o'clock or something in the evening. And it, it literally was, you know, I can't go on. My kids would be better off without me. I'd be, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and I wrote something back. I think I'd had a few drinks. I wrote something back as best I could. And, and I checked up on her the following, I'm not sure it was a her actually, checked up on them the following morning and they were still there. And you think, oh, you know, maybe you've done some good. And it's, uh, it's a nice feeling. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad. But we're all doing it together now. It's become so much bigger than, than, than my little project. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, really affect some change. We already have done a little bit, but I think we can uh, really do something quite big, actually. Well, thank you very much for, for both of you for talking to me. And uh, we'll end the recording now. And I'm sure we'll speak again. Um, so thank you, guys. And, uh, and take care. Thank you, thank Anna. You.